Welcome to We Built This Brand. I'm your host, as always, Chris Hill, and today we're interviewing Brandon Bruce. Brandon is the CEO and founder of Uncat, and prior to that, he has quite the career, starting with Cirrus Insight, which he helped get off the ground and actually grow into a company that ended up selling, um, as well as his involvement in the Knoxville area community with entrepreneurs. Um, everything from Startup Knox to KTAC, to Knox Entrepreneur Center, to all these other things that he has done. It's just an incredible story. He's got a great background and he is heavily involved in entrepreneurship in Knoxville. So um, definitely a great guy to talk to. And this was just a very illuminating conversation around what it takes to not only build a business, but what it takes to create good branding and how to continue to grow a business over time and be curious and um, grow a business. So I definitely love this interview. I love this conversation with Brandon. He's a good friend and, um, yeah, really hope you enjoy it too. So let's get into it. All righty. Uh, today on the podcast, I've got Brandon Bruce with me, Brandon. Thank you for coming on. We built this brand. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be here. Good to chat with you as always. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, man, we met, where did we meet? I think it was, I feel like I met you after when I was at Lirio and okay, yeah. if you, if you remember that, I feel like I met you there. Or I had bumped into you a few times as you were like an executive at Cirrus Insight and everything, but like we really got to know each other around Austin East. We did. Yeah. And I was trying to remember, yeah, how we f first met. It could have been around or through the Knoxville Entrepreneur Center, right? Cause we were both going to lots of events and uh, networking stuff like that. But yeah, the first project we got to do, was at Austin East Magnet High School, which was super awesome. So that was, uh, that was through Junior Achievement. And so a senior class there in entrepreneurship had the assignment to sort of start up, run, and then shut down a business in the course of a semester. So talk about a roller coaster, right? It's a quick turn. And so historically, students in those classes had uh, sold sweatshirts, and hats and lanyards. And this class did some of that too. But because I'd met you, I threw a curveball at them and said, Hey, have you all ever thought about building software? And they were like, well, no, no class has ever done that before. Like, what would we build? We only have a semester. And I said, well, Austin East has got a great brand. You got this Roadrunner, you got these amazing logos, whole community knows about them. You got this great alumni network. And so what if we built a mobile app? Cause you had expertise in that. What if we build a mobile app with a bunch of Austin East stickers and people could grab the stickers and throw them into their text messages and WhatsApp messages and everything else. And they were like, Oh, that'd be kind of cool. Like you could post them on Insta and everything else. And so, so they got into it. So they started grabbing the existing logos they had, but then embellishing them based on the sponsorships that we got. So, um, like Hard Knocks Pizza, for example, was a sponsor. So then it was the Roadrunner carrying a box, eating a piece of pizza in a sticker. So then when the sticker goes into a message, Hard Knocks gets a nice shout out and all those sponsors then contributed to the, to, to the students building the app. And so the, the cool to tie up that whole story, the cool thing was, I think the students learned a lot. It was unique. They got to play with a mobile app experience and operations, graphic design, right? Some light coding, et cetera, taking it to market, promoting something that was non-tangible, which was pretty cool. And then the upshot was they, they, they grossed more revenue than any other, you know, than any other junior achievement senior, senior entrepreneurship class that we have on record for that year. Right. So super awesome. They, they raked in a pile of money that, that they distributed for scholarships, which was super awesome. So yeah, man, that was great. We got to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I, I just remember that being a really cool experience because like, I love being able to give back to the community and be able to be involved with young people, high school, middle school age kids. Um, they have a special place in my heart, um, just from even personal life, like serving in church and then also where I can in other places. And so it was really fun to do that with you. Oh, it was. And we, I mean, I certainly learned a lot and I taught high school a couple of years ago. I taught a full year of entrepreneurship uh, to seniors and juniors and a few sophomores. And uh, yeah, you came in and hung out there too. And so uh, I learned a lot from that class because like we did some case studies of various types of businesses. But when it came to case studies of like social media companies, 
that's really where the students were like, y- you all lead because you know a lot more about it than I do because they grew up with it, right? They're still like newer for me, whereas they're fully into it. I had a student with a couple hundred thousand TikTok followers. So when it came to TikTok, I was like, you come up in front of the class and explain it because you know like a million times more than I do. So yeah, no, it's always a great two-way street where it's fun to go in and spend time with students. Absolutely. Well, today on the podcast, I brought you on um, because you've had a pretty cool career of going from starting a startup of your own, selling it, and then becoming an entrepreneur multiple times over now. Can't, can't get away from it. It's too much fun. <laughs> right? Um, I thought it'd be really cool to talk to you today about um, about that journey and really about um, how you go about building not just one brand, but brand after brand and keep coming up with um, new ideas for, for businesses. So um, yeah, I'd love to dive in, dive in there and uh, talk a little bit about your early career. So um, it looks like, pr- what were you doing prior to your first startup? Like set the scene for us. Yeah. So prior to Serious Insight, which is a startup I did with my best friend from college, and we started in 2011. Prior to that, I was working at Maryville College. And so I was doing advancement or development, which is basically sales in the nonprofit world, right? So talking with alumni and other supporters of the college, and they were contributing to scholarships and big capital development projects in the annual fund. And then the opportunity came to get involved in building this app with my friend Ryan. And so he had developed a lot of expertise in the architecture and coding on the Salesforce platform. And he saw a gap in the market where there was not a connector between Salesforce and Gmail. And this was early days for Gmail in the sense of like, plenty of end users had Gmail accounts, not too many businesses yet, but more were taking it up every day. So if a business wanted to go to the cloud, They were going to Gmail because Microsoft Office 365 didn't exist yet. And so we wanted to develop a plugin. Ryan started doing that uh, to get it out to market as early as we could uh, because we both saw the opportunity. And and it was an exciting time because cloud was starting to pop. And so to the extent that businesses were going to Salesforce, which is the market leader in CRM, and to Gmail because it was a really solid platform for cloud-hosted email, then we were there sitting in the middle and we could move data between the inbox and the calendar and Salesforce and vice versa on behalf of these sales teams. Um, so yeah, so before that, Maribel College, and then I was all in with Serious Insight. That's a neat connection because it sounds like you were already in a field that could use your product. And then that became ultimately what you ended up selling and creating. Yeah, I remember when Ryan called just kind of run the idea by me And I was like, well, I don't have a lot of operating experience with Salesforce itself, but with CRM in general, right? We used a CRM at the college. I'd used some platforms with previous companies. So I was like, I get the problem you're talking about, which was essentially as an end user, you spend most of your time having conversations like we're having now or in the inbox or the calendar. And it's an afterthought to go into the customer relationship management system, which is a database and make an update. Like I talked with Chris, this is what we talked about, et cetera. And so what we were building was a way to sync data. So like, okay, we exchange 10 emails. They all end up cataloged in the CRM so we can keep track of the relationship. But also so that I could see your profile in my inbox. Anytime you email me or I emailed you, it would say, oh, it's Chris. And the last time he bought from us was this. He's been a customer for this long. He works with so-and-so. And so it provides this nice kind of 360 degree view of who you're talking with versus just a blank email screen. Um, so yeah, that's how that one started. And that, I mean, that's quite the risk too, like going from, you know, a known secure job to all of a sudden, I mean, maybe I'm sure there's some like bonuses in there for doing fundraising stuff. So you've got that little bit of uncertainty financially, but like as a salesperson, essentially, um, I could be wrong, but, um, but most people do, but like you have some use to risk, but then all of a sudden to be in the deep end and in that chasm of like, Oh, how are we going to make money on this? Like, that's got to be quite the quite the challenge. What was that like? It, it's what I it's what I wanted for a long time, right? So to get involved with a startup that had that kind of risk profile, right? Like high potential. Um, I've always liked the quote that I learned only after we started. But you know, an entrepreneur works eighty hours so they don't have to work forty. Like I like the idea of basically going all in on something and just like, hey, we're just gonna work on this all day because this is what we want to do. And there's 
sales work to be done and there's customer service work to be done and we got to patch this fix on the app and then we got to reach out and do partnerships and sponsor a conference and so it was just a million things to do every day and i liked that aspect where it felt really scattered because it also felt like uh, for me and certainly ryan felt this way too we were always learning like there wasn't a day where it was like oh, i just dialed it in today i did the same thing i did late yesterday it was always something totally new and different so it was an experience in accelerated learning and it was a total emotional roller coaster in the sense especially in the early days but really throughout the life of the company in the early days like you get a sale and you feel like you're on top of the world like this is trending right the line goes up because you've only been in business for five days so it's like a sale moves the needle and then the next day there's no sales so it's like uh oh <laughs> like maybe that was it maybe no one else is going to come um and so there's an excitement there but there's also a you know it keeps it keeps you on your toes keeps you hustling yeah yeah um, when you think about that first brand that you've built, like b building Cirrus and everything that you did there, um, what goes into building a brand when you first start? Like, did you think about the, I mean, you thought about the name, but like, what did you really think about as far as like building a brand when you first started, started Cirrus? So Ryan had previously run a consulting group called Cirrus Consulting Group. And so he was pre all in on the concept of Cirrus because it's a high wispy cloud and we were going to be in the clouds. And so Cirrus came with it. And originally it was going to be called uh, Cirrus Connect. And so the first logo almost looked like a, like a hurricane, right? With two clouds spinning and one was a C faced one way and one was a C faced the other way and they were interlocking. And then either because there was some sort of conflict with some other existing brand or because he just decided he liked insight better than connection. Insight felt maybe a, a higher level value. It changed to Cirrus Insight. He kept the, the two interlocking C's because uh, it was like, it still looked fine. And then it became Cirrus Insight. So, so it's funny to think about because it became very popular in the Salesforce market. We were the third most reviewed app behind, at the time, DocuSign and EchoSign, which are obviously like huge applications out there. And then, you know, here's our little company, but people really liked it. So they left us a lot of nice reviews. Um, but, but when you think about brand, right, it's two words. Both words are on the you know, longish side. Uh, Cirrus is not necessarily something that everyone knows how to say or spell the first time properly, right? So some people would call and say, I'm calling from, for Cyrus. And it's like, oh, it was close. Okay. Um, we, I heard people call like, hey, I'm here for Citrus Insight. And I was like, that'd be such a great brand if I was in like the orange juice futures market. Like we provide insight into citrus. Got my, got my finger on the pulse of the citrus market. Um, and then when I kind of liked it, sometimes people would call and say, I'm, I'm interested in serious insight. And I was thinking, aren't we all, right? Let's stop playing games. Let's get serious. This is serious insight. So I never objected to that one. Um, but yeah, nevertheless, it, you know, it was... It was popular. So as a name, we, we stuck with it. Um, Cirrus Insight, we changed the logo uh, a couple times. The thing that came with the logo. So it used to be those C's. And then over time, we adapted it. Um, I mean, a funny internal <laughs> story that I don't know that we've told before, but we, we sort of had a bunch, we had sort of a little internal design charrette, right? So here's a bunch of logos that could work. And then one team looked at them first. And then it was like, hey, the first team liked these. What do you think, second team? And so the first team really liked this one logo. And I was looking at it and I was like, you know, there's something about it that I, I, just, I just don't love. And they're like, yeah, but the rest of the team really liked it. So, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but I'm a co-founder. So maybe my vote it counts for a lot. But I, I couldn't put my finger on like, what, what's the issue here? There's some problem with it. So I don't know if at that time you could sort of take an image and compare it with existing images, but instead I was just doing some searching like, Hey, show me an image that looks like this, like this. And it popped up and I was like, now I know what the problem is, right? So the Google search revealed that it was very, very close to a logo that I had seen before. And I'd seen it before in a restroom because it was the logo for a company that makes urinal cakes. <laughs> And I was like, I found it, guys. We can't use this. It's too similar. <laughs> plus, I don't love the association. So, so we ended up having not used that one as nice of a logo as it was. Uh, and we came up with one that's sort of used an envelope and can wink at you, right? So it had more to do with the inbox. And, and that one we stuck with for quite a while. 
That's that's brilliant. And I've I've always jokingly said like to be in good in marketing, you kind of have to have a dirty mind. Like you have to be able to make those bad associations because that's how you make sure you put out a clean logo that doesn't get you in trouble. But um, but yeah, that's that's great. Before that, I should have mentioned no sooner did we launch that we got a letter in the mail and it was from a company that does that you'll see their name on ATMs. It's Cirrus, right? They're a big financial clearinghouse. And so they sent a letter and it was a nice letter. It just simply said, hello, we're Cirrus, right? We're a huge company. And so just to be clear, you guys focus on the data between the inbox and the CRM. We don't do that. So that's fine. But we do everything finance. So you're not going to do anything finance, right? And we just wrote back and said, right. <laughs> and they were like, and you're fine. Then you're fine. Right? But you can imagine if we had said like, no, we, we're kind of interested in transact, they would have been like, yeah, no, mm -mm. no, no, we've got a, we've got a big legal team that would like to speak with you. So, so anyway, at first when we were opening the letter, it was like, uh oh, like we just started yesterday and we already have like a cease and desist, but it was more of an informational, Hey, stay in your lane. We own the finance lane. And we're like, yep, you can have it. That's fine. Having a background doing craft beer podcasts, like you, you see that happen all the time. Like it could be the naming of a beer. It could be the naming of the brewery. I mean, we have Mar We the reason we had Sawworks Brewing is because it used to be Marble City and Marble Brewing out in Arizona didn't like that very much. So, so yeah, that, I mean, that, that's always a challenge coming up with a unique, um, name that that's you know interesting to people i mean even towards the end of cirrus before i mean it's still around but like even before you all got acquired like cirrus aircraft came to knoxville so then you had two cirrus businesses in town and everybody said they worked for cirrus and that was a tremendous amount of fun right so when so when cirrus aircraft first came to knoxville and set up their initial office right They're, they were still building out their campus at the airport but then out of the clear blue sky pun intended, we started to get some phone calls, right? And people are like, no, this isn't, you know, what, this is the other Cirrus, we're the Cirrus Insight, not the Cirrus Air. But these are people calling interested in buying jets, right? So, so we joked internally, like, we should really try our best to like sell the jet and then call Cirrus Aircraft and be like, great news, right? We sold you a jet. And so just kick back some of the commission to our team. But that was just an internal joke. Never happened. We always just said, hey, you got the wrong number. You got to call these. They're great. They're here in Knoxville. You could call them over there. But it was funny when that happened because we were like, oh, I guess people are just looking at the beginning of the name and they're calling us. Yep. And it's the established Cirrus in town. If you look up Cirrus Knoxville, I'm sure it probably comes up before Cirrus Aircraft. It might. I'm not sure if it does anymore or not. But yeah, I mean, Cirrus Aircraft's a huge company, right? And super awesome plane. So it was fun to be. Uh, sort of mentally affiliated with them. <laughs> We've had the good fortune to get uh, get over to their facility and actually fly over there. So it's oh nice, it's pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, that's that's so cool. So um, so yeah, so you you built that brand, and then came time to sell the business. Like, how did you make that decision to sell Cirrus? Yeah, I mean, the, the growing the company, every aspect of it had an emotional component, right? I think especially when you're early in a business, or in my case, a co-founder, like it's a, it's a lot of identity is wrapped up in the fact that that's it's what you do. So it's what you're known as in the community. And so how you start to think about yourself, right? Like I, this is what I do with most of my waking hours is work on this. I think it was one of those things I, in some ways, I call it a seven year itch, right? We started in 2011 and when 2018 came around, it was like, okay, it feels like, feels like time, just feels like time to make a transition. It was not a decision we took lightly. We talked, Ryan and I talked about it for a long, long time over the course of many months, but then, uh, you know, multiple factors were started to weigh and we were like, okay, let's, let's run that process and, you know, go to market with it. And certainly, you know, everything is important at that point because it's a whole business as a totality. So you've got your revenue and your customer base and quality of earnings and your website and the app and the code base itself. But certainly a huge part of that is the brand, right? When people think of or say the name Sears Insight in the Salesforce ecosystem, what do they think about, right? Is this a, do they have a positive affiliation? Do they have a good experience when they stop by our booth at the expo? When they see the logo, do they know what it stands for? Do they know that it's an inbox plugin? Um, all those things, you know, certainly weighed. So it was helpful to us to have, you know, thousands of really nice customer reviews, uh, a lot of blog posts out there, mentions on you know, dozens and dozens of podcasts, for example, that's like, hey, we're talking to the founder of Cirrus. This is what they're all about. And so it was great to have all that out there. So certainly the brand was a big part of it. Yeah. 
I've heard that acquisitions can be a um, an emotional experience because of that. Like it's it's a very almost intrusive. Maybe I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but it's it be, can become very personal because all of a sudden somebody's looking at you and going, "This is what I think you're worth." And this is what that thing that you've worked on for seven years, I think, is worth. Well, and you're starting to evaluate things that that previously you didn't attempt to evaluate or even explain to folks, right? Like, you know, the logo is the logo. And our brand and what how we represent ourselves out into the public is how we do it. It's part of the culture of the company now. And then all of a sudden, you're trying to kind of explain it to somebody. And so, it's a very meta activity of like, well, I... I'm nice to people because I'm nice to people. It's like, yeah, but why? Are you, how would you value that? It's like, roll really highly. <laughs> like it's a, it was important to be nice to people for the last seven years. That That's why they like us. Um, so no, for sure. I mean, I, I think it was that way for the whole company because, you know, we all worked, we worked so closely together, right? We looked after each other and you know, someone had to be out of the office, cover for each other. And, um, you know, over the life of company seven years and it, we had at our peak probably close to 75 employees, you know, a lot, a lot of life happens um, with, with that number of people. And we all felt close to each other. So yeah, no, it was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a big deal. And um, remember it made waves in the news and everything, of course, when you sold it. And what did you do after that? For a little while after that, I was like, man, I'd like to just un- unplug a little bit. I mean, I didn't do a lot of that because I still kept up with, you know, messaging people and so forth. But I did spend some time going on some long hikes in the woods, just sort of like, whoa, that was a lot. You know, because because we really part of the culture of, of Sears Insight, which is not u- unusual for startups, but it was certainly the case for us. It was a, it was a culture of hustling, right? I mean, we tried to work smart for sure, but we also had the chip on our shoulder that said, "Look, we're competing with firms that have raised a tremendous amount of capital. They're backed by a lot of really smart people. Typically, they were located on the coasts, and we're like, hey, we're here in Knoxville, and we're going to get in the ring. We're going to battle it out. You know, we're going to try to sell." against them in deals and we're going to try to develop faster than they can. And so, yeah, there was just a lot of big days. And like I say, it, that's what I wanted. So it wasn't like, oh man, you had to work really hard. That sounds hard. It was like, no, I love that. Like I have such great memories of getting up at four in the morning, hitting it for three hours, getting the kids to school, doing the normal work day, doing dinner and stuff with everybody activities at home, and then hitting it again until about 10 o'clock at night and then rinse and repeat. We just do that every day of the week. And I thought it was great. It's like, what, you know, what better schedule than that? Um, because it was like constant interaction with clients and customers by email and, you know, go to meeting at the time and then zoom calls and go into conferences. And so it was frenetic in, in, in one fashion, but it was also like a really nice feedback loop where you're just constantly hearing from people and like, well, how does your company work? So it's a great, it's a great way to spend time if you're sort of innately curious right? If you want to know, like, well, how do you guys do sales? Oh, cool. Well, it's good to meet you. Like next time I'm in St. Louis or whatever, we should hang out. And, uh, you know, you should use our app also, right? Try to close sales that way. Yeah. I'm sure stopping all that just has to be like, like you said, I mean, it was like, whoa, like there's a rush to being still, I would imagine. I know from personal experience, at least it's like when you actually intentionally slow down, it just is like, What's happening? What do I do? <laughs> I emailed a friend in Atlanta and just said, because he had been really helpful to us with, with advice through the life of the company. And, and so I emailed him and said, Hey, by the way, we did, we did do a sale. And, and, um, and he's like, Oh, congratulations. What are you going to do now? And I said, well, I'm going to take a little break, but I'm having meetings with everybody in town and catching up on their startups and thinking about, you know, next steps. So I'm going to take a break. And, and he simply wrote back and said, that won't last long. And then it was one of those, hey, for better or worse, this is how we're wired. It's in the DNA. You can take a break and you probably should, but you want that energy. Like you, you've got energy to spare. You got to get it out there and work on stuff. So yeah, after that, it was it was really the start of of lots of kind of projects because everything starts as a project. Cirrus didn't start as like, hey, let's go build a company and see if we can make something of substance that really sticks around for a long time and serves tens of thousands of users. It was more of just like, Hey, I've got this idea for an app. Ryan's coding. He's like, do you have time to put together a website? It's like, oh, I'd love to. Like to work with him and also just a chance to hack a little bit. Like, yeah, I'll put together a website. And it's like, hey, people are starting to come to the website. Like, oh, they want to use the app. Okay, well, let's let them use it. And now they're asking if they can pay for it. And let's let's do that too. And so, you know, all of a sudden it's like, now now you're in. Now you got to start up. That's awesome. And then those projects turn into other things, right? So what what happened with those projects i know like for a while you were with um startup knox i think you're still helping with that uh, knox entrepreneur center k-tech those are just some of the things that you've been working on like 
How did all that build out and how has that grown for you? Yeah, I mean, it's been a great experience for me to have a chance to serve on a lot of boards. So you mentioned a few, Knoxville Entrepreneur Center, Junior Achievement, the Muse, our Children's Science Museum here, um, K-Tech. So Knoxville Technology Council, K-Tech, uh, was an idea that both I and John McNeely had. I sort of came to him with, hey, we should have a technology council in Knoxville because lots of other communities and states have one. We don't have one. We should have one. And he said, I've been thinking the same thing, right? So it's one of those, the ideas in the water. And once we started rapping about it, we just decided, well, let's just, let's just do that. Let's just start it. And so, so that was one project where both of us put a lot of time and energy getting that off the ground. And now, now it's happening, right? It's been out for you know, three, four, maybe even this could be even year five of K-Tech, which is crazy to think about. It's pretty awesome. Um, so that's, that, that organization's thriving. Um, yeah, Startup Knox was an idea I had with John Bruck when we were coming back from Cincinnati from a conference up there. And one of the things we saw in Cincinnati was this ecosystem chart that looked like a subway map. So it was like, here are all the resources for entrepreneurs in Cincinnati. Super colorful, tons of resources, a little bit hard to navigate, sort of like a subway map, but we liked the idea. It was like, and so then we started talking on the way back. We're like, well, yeah, but you know, Knoxville is a little bit of a smaller city in terms of population. We got a lot of resources here for entrepreneurs. And like, is there a directory? Is there like sort of a go-to resource? And we're like, oh, I don't think so. So, so we basically put together a little ecosystem map, right? Here are educational resources, pitch competitions, funding sources, you name it. And we put that together and then, and, and that was nice, distributed that, you know, printed workbooks, uh, PDFs. And then I started to think it'd be fun uh, and part of this was probably inspired from knowing you and other folks that are doing cool creative stuff. Is I was like, well, just do podcast. I should interview other entrepreneurs and just hear their story, right? I've told my story a little bit. And I was like, I want to know what it's like to be a maker and have a company that does, you know, jewelry. And then what about this other person's software company? And what about this company that's, you know, now one of the biggest companies in the United States that, you know, started in gas stations and now is the biggest seller of diesel fuel? What about the folks that sell manufactured homes? You know, what about this uh, invisible fence? That's kind of a big deal. PetSafe's huge company now. So, so it was a neat opportunity to interview companies, startups, if you in, in every range from folks that started 50 plus years ago, right? So Mr. Haslam, Mr. Clayton, Mr. Boyd, and then a bunch of other folks that are very early in the journey where it's like, yeah, we started six months ago. You know, we got a patent. We're trying to figure out how to license it. We're trying to figure out how to go to market with this. And so, so I did, I don't know what it ended up being. It might even be like a couple hundred episodes of startup Knox. I did a bunch of them. And then when I taught uh, high school, then each of the students brought an entrepreneur onto campus to interview them. And we recorded those. And so all those interviews became part of the podcast, which is pretty neat. So you get to listen to a high school student interview an entrepreneur in Knoxville. Most of them were in Knoxville. Some were remote uh, about their experience growing their company. So, you know, everything from a, you know, thriving hotel in Gatlinburg to an early stage tech transfer out of Oak Ridge National Lab uh, here in town. So yeah, that, that was that was a neat project too. Um, what else? There's a whole bunch of them. One of the ones that I'll mention because I just went to a little uh, celebration dinner with them and they're about to start their ninth cohort is 100 Knoxville. And so, and you and I have talked about that one before, but that was an idea that came from Memphis. And so, and the story is kind of fun, which is I was at the 3686 conference in Nashville, which is a big statewide entrepreneurship conference, uh, which is coming up by the way. So it's in, in, in September. I don't know when this episode will air, but it's there. Um, and so I went to that conference and I received text messages out of the blue from a number I didn't recognize, but it just said, Hey, we're getting a bunch of people from around the state together for dinner. Do you want to come? And I was like, sounds great. Cause I like to eat and meet people. So I showed up and there were folks from all over the state. And so I kind of put the question to the table, like, hey, what's good that's happening in your neck of the woods? And I'll share some stories from Knoxville. And Memphis kicked it off and just said, have you heard of the 800 initiative? I was like, no, I've never heard of it. Tell me about it. And they, and they basically broke it down and had a really nice elevator pitch. They said, look, we have 800 black owned businesses in Memphis that have employees, about 39,000 sole proprietorships. We're going to work with 50 of the 800 and help them double their revenue. And I'm going to work with 200 of the sole proprietorships and get them up to 100K a year in revenue so they can hire their first employee. Full stop. And I was like, wow, what an awesome program. Like, we should do that in Knoxville. And they're like, oh, we'd love it if you did. And if we can help, we'll send you all the information. Like the whole playbook, 
you can talk with all the people that were part of the founding team, including the mayor of Memphis. And so I was like, that sounds like a great opportunity. So we started chatting about it in Knoxville, having some meetings, pandemic started. So we had some Zoom meetings and kind of came up with 100 Knoxville, one, because our population is smaller than Memphis. Our black population is smaller. So they had 800 that, that had uh, you know ongoing businesses with employees and there were about 100 in Knoxville. So we said, okay, we'll call it 100 Knoxville and we'll work with as many of those entrepreneurs as possible to help them just grow their businesses, right? Connect, connect the networks, uh, which, is, which is what the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Knoxville is all about. So with the support of, of the chamber and TVA was the first funder. They said, look, we'd like to support this. We like the idea. Uh, how can you put $25,000 to work? And we said, well, we'll do a cohort. We'll do a cohort of five entrepreneurs that will come in. We'll do a five week like accelerated sprint with a bunch of mentors from the community. And each of the entrepreneurs will get $5,000 toward their business. They can invest however they want. Could be in marketing, could be in making that first hire, could be in a piece of equipment that they need for their business. And so that's what started it. And now we're about to start cohort nine, which is super cool. So yeah, some really neat stories of, you know, all credit to the entrepreneurs, right? These folks out, they're out doing it. They're hustling, they're putting together businesses. Hunter Knoxville is designed to be that little booster, right? Help them just get to speed faster, get out a little bit faster. And so connecting them with customers, connecting them with funding sources, and, 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 and a lot of just mentorship ideas, operational efficiency, stuff like that. So it's a, it's a neat program, obviously. Uh, I, I, like, I like what's happened with it. And now KEC is running that program and it's doing an awesome job. Yeah, and that's, and that's really cool that, that's, that that keeps going. I think I saw something on your LinkedIn just about that cohort today. So that's really cool. That's really neat that you're involved in all that. No, it's a, and, it, and, to, and to your overall uh, theme for the podcast, it's a great brand. Right, people around town now will talk about, hey, a hundred Knoxville. I was, you know, cohort four. Like I'm in there, and I'm connected with the other cohort, and we're and we're working on something. Right, we're trying to have this big revenue impact over the course of a certain number of years. Our original target was, hey, let's have a plus ten million revenue impact over the course of five years. And so, well, we'll have to do a look back, right, and track that, and, and see if we get there. And hopefully, we'll meet and exceed that goal. And if if we're short, we'll be like, okay, well, how can we double down? Um, but all the feedback we're getting from the program from the participants, from the mentors, from area businesses were connected with stuff. It was like, yeah, keep doing it. It's working. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so you go from all that and now you've started another company. Um, Uncat. Tell me Uncat. about Uncat. What is Uncat. it? <laughs> Look, any excuse to use cats in branding is a good reason to start a company. So, so Uncat, uh, uh, that idea came from Adam Slack, who runs a bookkeeping firm in Knoxville called Two Roads. And when, when he and I had lunch about three years ago, he was talking about, I was asking him, like, you know, what tech have you implemented? Because he's a very well-known, they were the first firm of the future that Intuit announced back in 2016. So it was like super awesome, great growth. Uh, and then classic question, right? What still keeps you up at night? What are the problems you're still trying to solve? And what came up was uncategorized transactions. You're like, look, at end of every month, all these transactions, you don't know what some of them are. So you got to ask the clients, you export a spreadsheet and send them an email and chase the client, try to get them to respond. And then they finally do respond. And then you copy and paste all their answers into QuickBooks. He's like, it's a terrible process. It doesn't make any sense to do it that way anymore. Do you think we could build an app for that? Could we just automatically sync uncategorized transactions from QuickBooks into an app, let the clients respond to them, upload receipts and stuff. And then the accountant or bookkeeper can come in, look at the responses and say, oh, if that was what it was for, we'll put it in the correct account and then sync it back into QuickBooks. And then you can close the books and generate accurate financial reports and file taxes properly and the whole thing. And so I was like, that's a great idea because I used to receive those same spreadsheets when I was a client. I was like, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I was like, I totally know what you're talking about. And so, so we were like, okay, you know, can it be built? That was the first question. I was like, I have no idea. So we started looking at the QuickBooks API and started working uh, with my good friend, Jared, who's a great uh, a computer scientist and architect, the PhD from University of Tennessee. And so, so he was like, oh yeah, I'd love to start you know, building this with you guys. So, so we started building it. And now it's a, yeah, it's a really nice application that helps out quite a few people. I think we've got like 15,000 users on the platform. So it's a mix of accounts, bookkeepers and their clients, right? So they'll connect their clients to the platform. And to the point at the top, you know, Uncat evokes uncategorized, which it's supposed to. But also, we decided to adopt a cat as, as the primary sort of branding uh, mascot, or as we affectionately call it, a mascot. Um, so any excuse to put a cat gift in an email or 
put at the top are the Uncat logo is sort of an homage to like the, the FedEx style logos where it's the logo, but there's something else to see there. So the U in Uncat, if you turn it 90 degrees is a question mark because these are uncategorized transactions. So it's kind of a mystery. And I thought Kaylee, the graphics did a great job with that. I was like, that's clever. I really like it. And then I was on a call actually like a month ago and a client said, oh, I love what you did with the logo, how you made the U a cat tail. <laughs> I was like, oh, like, that was not intentional. But now, absolutely, it's also, it's also a cat tail. So, so I was looking for like an image that would show a person herding cats because a lot of accountants will describe the process of communicating with clients and trying to get information back. It's like, oh, it feels like herding cats. Like it's so difficult to wrangle it and nail down that information. And so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try to use that as a motif. And in the course of, you know, search around, it ended up being a cat doing the herding. And I thought, oh, that's like ironic, right? It's a cat with a sombrero riding, riding a pony. And so, yeah, now we put that up at conferences on a big banner and stuff. And so now sometimes when I ask people, how do you hear about Uncat? They're like, oh, like I saw you guys at a conference. And then I was trying to remember, like, what's the, what's the cat? app like i need the cat app and so you know i googled for it and there you were and so you know now i'm checking out your software so yeah people definitely remember the cat part of it which is the fun part of the brand makes people smile i think you should for your next marketing initiative do something where you have a dog dressed as a cat so that it's an uncat that's true yeah some people will be like so uncat you got something against cats i was like no i i love cats I've had my whole life i've got two cats they join me on demos i'm kind of surprised they haven't jumped on the computer during our conversation because they know when it's like, oh, you're on a video call? I'd like to walk on the keyboard now. Um, but yeah, no, people come by and they're, they, you know, they want to share pictures of their cats and swap cat stories. And I think it's great because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, people want to have, have a really positive experience with a company. It's not just about we make an app and it saves you time. It's like, well, every app is supposed to save you time. So that's pretty much table stakes. And, and some of this was, was just learned over time. And especially from some of the team at Sears Insight, we go to conferences and one of our most successful folks in a conference environment, James, was just brilliant with people. You just connect with them really fast because you don't have long at a booth to make a connection with somebody. And so I'd watch him. And it's like 30 seconds after he's meeting somebody, right? They're like laughing, high-fiving, sharing pictures of kids on the phone, taking a selfie in front of the booth. And I'm like, it's pretty amazing. What's going on here? And he was like, look, you know, people are here certainly because they're here for the sessions. Like they do want to learn something. They're here because their company sent them. So they're supposed to come back with some takeaways, some ideas of apps they might be able to use. But he's like, but they also want to come here and have an awesome time. They want to be entertained. And they want to feel good about themselves, the work they do, the experience they're having. So rather than trudge through an expo with 100,000 people in it, you know, if they're stopping at our booth, they're going to have a great time. And I was like, yeah, I think you nailed it. Like, that's exactly. So when people show up at the Uncat booth, I'm going to tell them all about the app and I'll answer their tech questions. But they also just want to laugh. They want to get a little piece of cat swag they can take home to their kids or put on their desk. And, and, and just smile. I mean, having a positive experience with the brand, I think is a long way to helping people, um, you know, remember your brand and engage with it in the future. If you have something funny or memorable, they're going to continue to, um, you know, track with your brand, even if they may not necessarily even use your product. If it's a cute cat thing and you do a bunch of funny cat memes, they're probably going to keep tracking with you on that. Right. Oh, no doubt. And, 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 you know, I think it's good to, <clears throat> It, everybody, pretty much everybody has competitors in the market, right? You're going to compete with some folks. Um, and I always, you know, when people say, well, how do you compare with so-and-so? And I'll try to give an honest, like, Hey, they're pretty good at this stuff. We don't do that stuff. We don't touch it. We focus on this and we believe that the thing that we focus on, we think we're the best at it. And here's why, right? And just lay it out and they're going to make their own decision. But anytime someone brings up a competitor, like it's definitely a best practice in my experience. And certainly that's advice that I've been given uh, in sessions and from consultants and stuff. It's like, hey, you don't really want to go after a, a, another company's brand, right? I mean, unless, unless you got a great reason to like, uh oh, have you heard that there's a big problem? Like then it's like, okay, that's fair. But otherwise, like when people say, oh, you know, what about this company? Then I can honestly say, because I've gone to enough conferences now, like, oh yeah, I've met their founders. They're great folks. Yeah, really cool. Oh yeah, they're from Texas. They're from California. Yeah, I really enjoyed chatting with them. So they're good people, right? So then it's like, oh, cool. So you guys know each other. So everyone's like, this is a safe space. Everyone's friendly then. Oh yeah. No, you could work with them. You could work with us. Everyone's cool. And now let's just compare the experience you'll have with the tech. Like how can we help you? 
and you, you, you know, you sort of give the, you're giving the customer the benefit of the doubt when it comes to like, Hey, you're smart. You can make a good choice. I'm going to try to trick you into buying one app or another app. This is what we do. This is what they do. You choose. We're here if you need us. Um, and I think that helps to develop a level of trust where even people come back later. Like I looked at you guys like a year ago, didn't think I needed you. Now I've got this client absolutely need you. And we had a good demo and it's like, okay, great. Welcome back. Like this, that happens so often. Folks come back after a year, two years, three years. And if they had a good interaction, it just wasn't the right time. If they feel like, yeah, I saw you at the booth and you guys were, you guys were cool. You're friendly. And it looks like you made a lot of progress. Like, yeah, we're still, we're still here. You know, then, then, then they feel good about doing business. It's that uh, permission based marketing. I think right now is a lot of what we're seeing in the the industry where people want to be the ones to initiate the engagement. They want to be the ones to be a part of that. And if you come at them too hard, they're going to back away. And so being that friendly person, being that nice person and um, attracting them, I think that makes a lot of sense um, just by having those relationships. I mean, we, what are we without our relationships anyway? I mean, even a brand, what does it stand for if it doesn't have a good standing or good relationships with its customers? Right. And look, most, most, most of us, small businesses, right, are going to get most of our customers and certainly our best customers by referral. And so not only is it permission based, but it's not even permission to talk to us. <laughs> it's, it's, you're talking to another customer. And so, you know, the best customers are going to come because it's like, oh, Chris told me about this. I trust Chris. He's using it. He says it saves him time. I believe him. So you're like 95% of the way to a sale before they even contact you with a referral. And that's, and that's, why it's like it's that little ripple that goes out into the world you have one customer with a great experience they'll take care of you because inevitably they're going to tell somebody somebody's going to ask them what do you use for the uncategorized stuff driving you up the wall like oh yeah i don't do spreadsheets anymore i just use this little app it's super great like oh how do you find it oh, yeah. well what about customer support oh yeah they're on it and they're really nice about it like okay cool yeah sounds good i'll sign up and that, that's so so that's the best the chicken or egg part of it or the catch-22 part of it is like uh you know the permission base, like, Hey, they want to reach out to you first. It's like, yeah, but how do you get, even get on their radar? Right. So sort of the low level, you know, climbing the marketing ladder, how do you just generate awareness? And that's, that's a big part of the game. I think certainly the way I think about it and talking with other founders, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone's online now and everyone's got a phone now and all this other stuff. But it's like, it's very noisy. I mean, how do you just get in front of people and let them know you're not even trying to sell them. So you just want to know that you're here. Hey, we exist. If you want to talk to us, you can come to us. We're not going to hammer you. But we just want to let you know we built something that has value. And so it's thinking of ways to get out various channels, ways to message that will resonate with people. What, just out of curiosity, what are you doing to that degree? Like, how are you finding those new customers and making noise in spaces? Hacking at it like any startup founder. I, you know, one of the things I've mentioned conferences, um, I, I, you know, I believe in conferences. They can be expensive. That's the hard part. Uh, cause not only do you have the cost of the conference in the booth, but you got to fly there and you got to stay in a hotel and you got to get meals and all the things. So it adds up, <clears throat> but having that, that in-person opportunity to meet somebody, shake hands, hear their use case at their firm and then show them the software. Right? And then like, that's pretty strong versus, uh, I hope they find our website someday. Um, and so showing up, being visible at those, at many of the biggest conferences, especially over the course of a few years. Um, I think has been valuable because we were even advised by some people in the industry like, hey, look, this is a risk averse space, right? Like the book's got to be right every time. So people will look at software and then they just want to make sure you're going to be around next year. So come now, build some awareness and come back next year so people see again and then they'll get curious. Like, well, you're back? Oh, great. You, you made it, right? You, you crossed the Rubicon. You survived your first year. So, so now that we've been in market two and a half going on three years, uh, it helps for people to say like, oh yeah, we, we saw you. We thought we might want to use it. We just want to make sure that you're around and that you get good reviews and that we can trust it. Um, so conferences has been part of it. Um, it is part of a marketplace. We're in the QuickBooks app store. So if people are looking for things to help them, right? Reporting software, expense management software, APAR software, then they'll also hopefully see Uncat and say, oh yeah, that, I need some of that. Um, and so we definitely care a lot about the reviews on the app store, just like anybody that sells in a marketplace, right? If you're on iTunes and Apple or the Salesforce app exchange or the play store, any of those I think are important channels. Um, we've been doing a lot of joint marketing with other partners and we did a lot of that at Sirius Insight too. So sort of anyone else that's selling to the same customer in the same marketplace, we will offer to like, Hey, we'll get the word out about your app. You get the word out about us. 
and let's do it around a joint webinar. We can both show what we do. And I think a lot of people will sign up for those because it's almost inherently or implicitly more educational than signing up for a single company webinar. You show up for one company, you know you're going to get the pitch because it's like, what, what else is going to happen? You show up to see two or three apps and it sort of feels like, well, they got to cut the time in half or in a third. So they're just going to show the highlights. And honestly, even if I'm not interested in one of the apps, I might be interested in the second one. And so I'll go and I feel like I've gotten bang for my buck as a customer just showing up and learning about multiple apps in one webinar. So we've been doing a lot of that this year, uh, reaching out to other companies and seeing how we can be helpful and vice versa. Um, you know, what else? I mean, we'll, we'll sort of post, you know, I call them proof of life on social. That's not like our primary channel, but it's basically letting the world know, hey, we're still here. We're here. We're around. Um, we competed in one, this little bracket challenge that was around March Madness. So that was kind of a cool way to get some additional press. Um, and so we tried to sort of, you know, send our supporters there, like, hey, make sure to vote for us every round. And so that was super awesome. We got a lot of nice grassroots support for that. So yeah, really looking for any opportunity to, to build awareness. It's quite the long haul. I mean, I know even at HumblePod, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to be, to find a way to make yourself aware because you can't just tell someone you need a podcast. Not everybody needs a podcast. I know it's a shocker, but not everybody does. And so finding ways to, to get into that audience and stuff, I totally know what you all are going through because not everybody needs Uncat, but those that do find a lot of value in it. As you're talking about it, I'm going, should I, I should tell my bookkeepers about this. Uh, it's much better than the random. Please do. Yeah. For anyone listening, please, please do. Please do. <laughs> it's much better than the, um, the end of month texts going, Hey, what was this expense in this again? Yeah, it provides a cadence. It's a way to stay on top of it. So that when end of year comes, tax time comes, month end financials come, it's like, Hey, we got this. Like we do this. It's part of what we do. So it becomes part of the culture. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the goal certainly. But yeah, I remember hearing the quote years ago, uh, someone said tongue in cheek, like 50% of marketing works. We're just not sure which half. And I was like, yeah, that's part of the challenge. So it's like, I like everybody when someone joins a demo, be like, Hey, how did you, how did you hear about us? Sometimes I say, how did you first hear about us? And, um, frequently, not always frequently, man, it's a, it's a mishmash. It's like, well, uh, you know, I think I got an email uh, from you guys, some outreach, and then yeah, I might have seen a post like uh, one of the influencers posted on Twitter said something nice about you guys. Anyway, I was on the app store checking it out. And I remember seeing you at a conference two years ago. And so you're sort of like, well, w do I invest in all four of those things? Was one of them the most important? You know what I mean? Uh, and then others will just say, you know, whatever. I saw a video on YouTube. So I thought I'd check it out. And then it's like, oh, well, is that now our most important channel? And, and you kind of have to have a longer conversation to find out like what video on YouTube? Was it my video? Was it an influencer video? Was it an ad we bought that pre-rolled before a different video? So it's always, that's an interesting nut to crack is, is um, and obviously people are experts in this, but attribution, right? And then, and a lot of attribution goes down to choice. So some is direct, like you're on a AdWords campaign, someone clicks on the ad, they come, they convert. And you can be like, well, it looks like it came from there. You know, positive, positive, but you're trending. Most of the time, it's like, okay, they came from four places. How do we want to partition the attribution? You know, is the video the most important thing or should we be doing conferences all year round? I don't know, a combination of both. So some of it, uh, yeah, in all honesty, is, is scattershot. We're just trying a lot of things to try to be out there, that we exist. We're waving the flag. Totally understand that mentality towards trying to grow a business and trying to figure out what works, what doesn't and what works when. Cause I mean, we, we run into the same things, you know, building our business. So, yeah, well, and you're just open to, I mean, most of you just open to something working like a little bit, in which case you do a little bit more and keep doing it. And sometimes things will work, uh, dramatically well. And then you've got like a little breakthrough and maybe you establish a channel and then some things work dramatically well and peter out really quickly. So it's like, okay, that worked and it lasts for a month. And that's, that's all, that's all you get. So it, it's just, again, it's curiosity, I think is what makes it fun is just say like, well, we're going to try this thing and it may flop, but if it works, then we'll double down and we'll do it, we'll do it over and over again. That, so back in the early days of Sirius, we were running some like, you know, like whatever, five, $10 a day AdWords. And, um, we were like, okay, we closed the sale. We've got a little bit more budget. Let's go ahead and bump the budget five bucks for the next few days. Okay. So big campaign here, right? So we bump the budget by $5. A bunch of traffic hits the website, crashes the server. 
And we're like, what, what changed, right? Super weird. And Jason, who ran marketing for us, was like, well, it looks like Google spent more than we authorized, sent us a bunch of traffic, but then since we hadn't authorized it, they refunded us. And we're like, that's super weird. Do you think it'll work again tomorrow? So we boosted up the server, right? Three more instances on the web host and then did it again. He just jiggled the budget by $5, sure enough. So when we changed it by $5, Google would spend $1,000 and then refund us $995. And they, that worked for one week. It was a bug, obviously, right? Like we did not invent anything here. We were just curious like what happened and then we were willing to rinse and repeat. Don't feel bad for Google in this story. They've done just fine. Uh, we spent a lot of money with them over the years too. So, but for that week, it was like a boon. I mean, here's this early stage startup. We have like a team of six. And now all of a sudden we're getting all this traffic to the website. It was super awesome. So we love that. Um, you know, we also intentionally routed traffic through the Salesforce app exchange in the early days because that was part of the algorithm. So we sort of by watching and paying attention, we figured out, hey, it matters. Our ranking depends on the number of people that install from that source and the number of reviews we get. So we sent everybody like, go leave us a review, please. If you like the app at all, leave us a review. But also, even though they could install directly from our website, we would take them from our website to the app exchange where they clicked a button to take them back to our website, which sounds like terribly inefficient because it was, but we, we got counted every time that way. And so then the algorithm would, hey, well, it looks like a lot of traffic. And so we were able to get ourselves up to the number one rank for like four months. And that was a nice little like self-fulfilling prophecy because when you're number one, people are intrigued. So they check you out and then that's more traffic. So it keeps you at number one. And so we did that for a while until they changed the algorithm. Um, but yeah, it's just little fun things like that. Just seeing, seeing what works. Growth hacking, if you will. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the biggest one from a sales standpoint was sending out an email from our you know, new marketing automation. We had never used one before. And we're like, let's send an email blast. What should we tell people? And we're like, let's tell them about the new version we're coming out with, like a product announcement. So we said, look, we're coming out with version two. Anybody who wants to see version two, grab time on our calendar because we'd love to show it to you. And we had a link to the calendar and you could book time. And everyone's thinking, listening to this podcast, like, yeah, duh. But at that time, there weren't that many calendars on software websites that you could just book time with the sales team. This was still like a relatively newish thing. So we're like, let's try it. So we send out this email and then Daniel, our lead salesperson walks in like, did you guys send an email? And we're like, yeah, why? And he's like, well, I've been given some demos, but when I just got off my last demo, I realized my calendar is fully booked next week. So from sending one email, we booked 40 hours of meetings on his calendar. And we're like, ooh, like game time. Like, we'll, we'll do this again. Like, let's do it again next week. Let's book your calendar again. Because that scales, right? As soon as his was booked, it's like, we need more salespeople. So yeah, that was a rinse and repeat for the life of the company because that never stopped working. So that was, that was one we held on to. That was a good discovery. Well, man, that's awesome. Well, we always wrap up the podcast um, with a question. And um, it sounds like you've listened a little bit, so you may, you may know what I'm about to ask. But I always like asking this question at the end, which is, what is your favorite brand right now? Just a brand that you're crushing on, that you use all the time, or that you just love to see new content from? So, so the brand that I interact with pretty much every day and I feel a little bit low when it goes into off season is the Premier League. I'm big into the English Premier League. I watch soccer highlights pretty much every day. There's a game. So a lot of, a lot of them on the weekend, obviously, but sometimes they have some midweek games. And so I'm really impressed with just the quality, right? There's definitely a big focus among teams. It's, it's high quality soccer. So I love watching it, but you can tell they pay a lot of attention to the experience that their fans are getting in person. I've never been to an in-person game, but it's on my list of like, I'd love to go over to the UK and watch a bunch of games in person, um, you know, across a whole bunch of teams. But, but also just the viewing experience, like I'm here in the States, like, so there's, you know, random person that loves soccer and loves to watch soccer highlights. And so they package the highlights really nicely. They cater to an American audience. They'll have their broadcasting team come over and do live shows out of some of the big markets in the States, like Atlanta, DC, New York, et cetera. So they're very intentional about building a global audience. And so, so it's cool. So it's fun to think back to like my early days playing soccer as a kid and now how big the game is obviously worldwide, but increasingly so in the U S so yeah, super bullish on that. And from a local perspective, all about 
won Knoxville, right? Our soccer team here. So, so I'm a small partner in that team, but I just, I just love it. I love going to the games, um, you know, supporting the team, getting out, seeing friends from the community, right? At the game saying, Hey to everybody. And, um, yeah. And it's really neat to have a team here in Knoxville. We were one of the, the few cities a, a couple of years ago when, when, when Drew McKenna and others started the team, we were one of the few Metro markets of our size that didn't have a soccer team, a pro soccer team. And now we do. So all credit to them for doing it, but I'm excited to see what will happen. Hopefully we can pull off a few wins here and get in the playoffs. Yeah. I got to see them talk at, I think it was Drew or one of the one of the head one Knoxville folks came and spoke to the Manchester United group. And I'm not personally like a like diehard man U fan, but one of my best friends is, and he had me come and help him with some stuff for one of their events. And we got to have him come and talk to us and stuff. And it's just neat. I mean, the passion for the team, the passion for Knoxville, like that's really cool. And I'm not as big of a soccer fan. I do enjoy watching it, but like I can definitely relate on like a formula one level. Like that's kind of like my yeah, exactly. diehard sports brand. Well, I love just the intentionality that, that the whole organization has brought to being part of the community from the start. Right. So it's beyond it's sort of like the, the, the formula one special on Netflix where it's like, I'm not, I didn't come to it from a car racing background, but I love the show because it's about the people less about the car, you know what I mean? And so one Knoxville's done that because it's really about the community and then it's like, it's soccer as a reason for everyone to get together, but it's always community first. And so, and they've done a great job of like a lot of intention around the branding, the colors, the logo. So, you know, really excellent merch and they would punch above their weight for a new team. The level of support they've gotten from, from Knoxville and even beyond from the region is really remarkable. So it's, it's fun to watch what they're doing. I think it's cool even how they're engaging with youth, like youth sports and youth activities. Um, my wife has been telling me about how, um, that's pretty much all the kids play one Knox soccer. Now it's not crush or anything else or AYSO. I, I only hear about one Knox soccer being the, the, the game in town, so to speak. Yeah, no, they've done, they've done a great job. And, and, and Sam leads that he had experience doing that in Chicago has done a great job of building the adult rec league. And now certainly a huge focus on youth. Uh, so making sure young people have the opportunity to get out and play a lot of soccer. And so it's great because it's all under one you know, big brand. So it's like, yeah, they have a great experience playing for their team, but then they also can come and watch, you know, watch the big kids play, uh, watch the pros. And so that's a neat like continuum in the community. Well, Brandon, thank you so much for coming on before I let you go. Is there anything you would like to promote or is there anything that you want to let people know more about? Like how can they get in touch with you? Oh, sure. I, yeah, I'm easy to reach. I'm six, eight. So if you see me around Knoxville, just say, Hey, um, but otherwise, yeah, my email is just Brandon at Brandon Bruce.com. I've had that address since forever, probably like 20 plus years since the internet started, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so you can always reach me by email there. I would say social, but really I'm still, I'm of the email generation. So I'm in the inbox more than I am on the social networks. Um, but yeah, uh, if any, you know, other entrepreneurs that are listening, if they want to connect and chat up the resources in town from the Knoxville Entrepreneur Center to 100 Knoxville to K Tech, et cetera, that's what we're here to do. Rising tide lifts all boats. So Knoxville's got great momentum. I'm excited about it. All righty. Well, Brandon, thank you much for, th thank you much. <laughs> that worked. Yeah. <laughs> that could be your signature sign off. That's part of the thank brand. Much. Yeah. That, oh, he man, said it again. So that that thank sounds so redneck now that I'm saying that. Thank you much. <laughs> Oh, Broadcasting from Knoxville, Tennessee, <laughs> <laughs> on the banks oh. of the mighty Tennessee River. That's what I would say in my intro. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> well, Brandon. No, great stuff. Always great to be with you. And yeah, I, I mean, the big takeaway, people need to keep listening to the podcast. Keep doing it. Absolutely. Brandon, thank you so much for coming on. And um, yeah, thank you all for listening. Yeah. See you next time.